Shalom, welcome to The Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Delmar, together with my co-host Mark Ronich of Statewide News Service and jbiztechvalley.com. We have a very, very special guest with us, Rich Mendick, and he's the Albany County Legislator of our own little district of Bethlehem, Selkirk, a lot of other areas in Albany County. But in any case, Rich, welcome to The Jewish View. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. Well, welcome. Uh, we should have had you on a long time ago. <laughs> well, I appreciate being here. Uh, what other communities do you represent besides Selkirk? Well, Selkirk is the one that I live in, but I also have South Bethlehem right. uh, through the redistricting that happened as part of the recent right. uh, new census in 2010. I now have Fearbush, okay, and I do still have parts of uh, Glenmont. Oh, good. Okay. That's all in our viewing area. In That's the right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you're, you've been in the county legislature how many? The, I'm in my second term, so about seven years now. And what did you do before you were county legislator? Uh, well, I spent a period of time, about five years, I was the full-time caregiver for my father, who happened to be uh, an invalid. Uh, and prior to that, I was the chief financial officer for a, uh, a national safety products company, Protective Industrial Products, that's out in Gilderland. Mm -hmm. And what, so you're a numbers guy? I'm a numbers guy. All right. and proud so to be one. What do you, th what do you think, yeah, I didn't say you're a geek, you're <laughs> a numbers guy. <laughs> uh, I just want to know, what did you think of the county budget the way it is now as opposed to what the impression was maybe a year or two ago? Well, the one thing that I was very glad to see was that we finally have uh, got to a point where we come in under the tax cap or at the tax cap. Uh, I actually put in a resolution a few years ago to try to get that accomplished. Uh, it didn't go anywhere, but we, we're there now. And that's a very important point because it at least puts some constraints on our spending. And the tax cap is 2%. It's 2% and plus or minus a little bit based upon a lot of factors. It's a very complex right. formula. And I think this year we were at 1.86. Okay. So you were pretty happy you voted for this budget or um, in favor of this budget? I was in favor of the tax cap. There was a number of things that the majority party put into this budget, moved stuff around, that I was not in favor of it, and I voted against it. Okay, so what weren't you in favor of? Uh, gee, that's, a, you know, my memory is while. not going to okay. serve me on this one. One of the things that I didn't like to do is that normally what they would do, when you have a person that put you the, are... Put the wire Oh, sorry. Yeah. For staffing positions, uh, let's say that you have a clerk position, and that will be a single line item in the budget. What the majority party says, we don't want to fund that single line item. We just want to take all those dollars and put them in a big contingency fund. What happened effectively is that when the budget was passed, if you had dollars on that line, you were now empowered to hire that position. What the what they did was, by putting in a contingency, every time that you want to hire somebody, you now have to run the gauntlet of the personnel committee and the audit and finance committee to get approval, and then the full legislature to get approval of that line item. Okay, so now you're, just so the audience knows, you're a member of the, you sit with the Republican caucus. That is correct. But you're a member of the conservative party? I am the first and only member of the conservative party to be elected to the county legislature. Now, I got to tell, on, on the, your own merit, but you also run on the Republican line? I do. Okay. I enjoyed the endo endorsement of both the Republican and the Independence Party. And the conservative. Uh, as well as yeah. the conservative party. So I wanted to, you know, I said to uh, the conservative county conservative party chairman one time that it's really a county legislature of conservatives because he gives his endorsement to the county, a majority of the county legislators, yes, and they should, you know, he should have some sort of event celebrating the conservatives in the county legislature, and he never went with it. Uh, <laughs> you know, but it doesn't surprise me. But you know, you you see how many of the Albany Democrats seek the conservative party line, and then I don't know if you think that they're conservative in their voting record, but. I, I there are a few that are <coughs> conservative in their voting record, but primarily they seek that line knowing full well the more lines you have, the more likely you are to get elected. So while they'll seek that line, 
they don't really have the philosophy. Or the ideology right. of that party. Exactly. But is, that makes it phony mm -hmm. to some extent. Well, that's your words, Mark. I, I know. Yeah. Okay, steer away from that a little. No, that's, <laughs> I'm just saying. That's I would love to see a more conservative approach in the in You the know, it's just interesting because we, um, in many shows, we have Albany County legislators, they're Democrats, but you're in the Republican, so you're in the minority. I mean, what kind of impact do you have as a minority member in the Albany County legislators like I mean, the assembly, a lot of many people will say, you know, in the New York State Assembly, a Republican doesn't really have that much say-so. I mean, you feel you have an impact? Well, there, are, the there are 10 out of 39 that are Republican. That is correct. And what, what we call the minority caucus, yes. Yeah. And, and you're absolutely right. We, we are what is known as a super minority, which means from a voting block, we can't get anything passed. And it, it even goes so far as that the majority party will make every effort to, to keep things that we put forward out of the public eye. But that doesn't stop us from bringing up the issues. Uh, and I think that, that that is the role that at least I have taken on, and I know many of my uh, colleagues in the, in the Republican Party have done the same thing, is we need to at least bring those issues to the public, make them aware of what is going on, and they can you know, make their decisions at the voting booth mm -hmm. you know, in the next election. And, how, and that takes a lot of, do you have a social media network set up amongst the Republican caucus that, I mean, how do you get the word out? Because the media doesn't cover what you say. Uh, we send out press releases. We do have, you know, uh, a website and we have, uh, uh, Christine Bendick used to have a blog on, in the TU. I, I think she still does. She may still. Yeah. She's no longer the, the chair. She's the deputy chair. Lee Carmen is now the right. chairman of the minority caucus. Uh, so we do have those avenues. Uh, and we do make every effort, like what I'm doing now, to just to try to get that word out. Okay, so ha uh, should, couldn't you be more Absolutely, uh, we can more always be, absolutely, we can always be more proactive. We've attempted things and we will continue to attempt things. Okay, so what's your big hot button issue now that you're, uh, you know, for 2014 that, you know, you're trying to get out there that people don't know about? Well, there really are two big issues. Okay. Uh, the first one is the Albany County Nursing Home, which is not a new issue. It has been on the agenda literally for a dozen years. Uh, we, are, we are now trying to establish a LDC, a local development corporation, whose sole responsibility would be the operation of the Albany County Nursing Home. But there are some real problems with that. And let me just give you a little bit of background so it, it, you have the context. Albany County Nursing Home loses about a million dollars a month. And that means that their expenses are a million dollars more than whatever reimbursements that they're bringing in. That's $12 million a year. The total Albany County budget is just under $700 million. Now, most of it, 90% of it, are state mandates, so we have no control over it. And of course, the state will then contribute to a lot of that. So the, the tax levy that you and I have to pay for is about $85 million. Well, 12 million out of that 85 is going to sustain the Albany County Nursing Home. That's a little more than 10% of every dollar that you and I contribute goes to this one facility. And just to give you some idea, we spent $12 million on a facility that houses less than 250 people. There are 60,000 seniors in Albany County of this a little over 300,000 residents. And their total programs, programs for the aging, we spend less than $2.2 .2 million. Mm, it's really wow. out of proportion. Really. It's way out of proportion. And, and, and it could be solved. And, and, and that's what we've been working very, very hard at. Uh, so do you have, are you optimistic that these, this guy from Long Island, from Nassau County, who's coming in to be the executive director of, the L of this nursing home, uh, is going to be successful with his plan? He's mentioned, you know, the, I mean, he's met with your caucus, I hope? Or he's not met with our caucus, but he has met with the Elder Care Committee. And, okay. and, well, and I'm not a member. I, I, I wish I were a okay. member. But though I'm not a member, I still go to the meetings and I've asked lots of questions. And to answer your question yeah. directly, uh, I think that he does not have a very good chance to put in the measures that were necessary to bring that operating uh, facility 
into some reasonable financial constraints. And the reason for that is, is that Albany County, the majority party, want to continue to control the operation of that nursing home. Mm -hmm. Even though they want to shift it to a, a local development corporation, right. LDC, they still want control. And let me give you a perfect example. Within the documents that was recently voted on, and I voted against it, uh, I actually tried to get it deferred, but is the, the concept that the employees for the Albany County nursing home under an LDC will be leased from Albany County. So they will still be Albany County employees. That way they get the health benefits. They get the health care, they get the pension, they get all that. We had five studies, four or five studies done in my short tenure. Every one of the studies came back and said, and these are studies that compare the operation of the Albany County nursing home with peer county facilities. They all came back and said the same thing. There's too much staffing. They're too highly paid. Their benefits are, are far too robust mm -hmm. comparatively. And so what does the, the majority party say? We basically want to maintain that status. There, to me, as an accountant, we have, we're attempting to lock in the one root problem of running that facility in a viable manner. Wow. You think it can be run in a viable manner once you're saying that as an account also? Is there a possibility, I mean, of... He's saying it can, I think he's saying it can, but he, it's not the way that's being proposed. Well, let me give you, yeah. uh, let me, right. let me s explain with a, a, a specific example. Mr. McCoy came in and he had a, a, a plan that we endorsed, and I spoke on this numerous times, that we were going to lease the operating, uh, the operation of the Albany County Nursing Home to a company that had 11 other nursing homes in the state of New York. They are the go-to company by the State Department of Health. When they have a, a nursing home that's faltering, they go to this company and make them the receivers. Now, they were willing to come in and run the, our operation because they felt that over a period of time, three to five years, that they could bring it into a break-even or a slightly profitable situation. So yes, I think it can be done. But the way that we're approaching it now, I don't think that it, that it's, it can be accomplished. The guys from Long Nassau County, these current uh, guys are saying that they can do it in a year to 18 months or right. something like that? That's what they say. And you don't think that has uh, a chance? They have some major <coughs> obstacles because part of the problem is, is that if we talk about all the staffing issues, whether it be just the number, whether it be their compensation, whether it be their benefits, mm -hmm. are all, these are all union contracts. Now, they would have to get the unions to back off of those contracts substantially. And I just don't see that happening. Right. What's the, what about the use, the uh, more efficient use of the beds? Because I, you said that it's a 250-bed facility, yes. but not all 250 beds are being used because some people, elderly people, need a, a single room. That's correct. And they, they have two beds in the room. So one bed can't be used because this individual who's the client, patient, whatever word you use now, yeah. is, uh, ne needs a single room. Yeah. So, they're sa so the, these folks who are going to come in said that they can redesign this to make it more efficient in terms of the use of the beds, which brings in more Medicaid dollars, which brings in more revenue. What they really, what I thought I heard them say, mm -hmm. uh, and, and they may have said that, Mark, and I'm not contradicting yeah. you, but what I heard them say is that what they would do is they would go back to the health department on those individuals that have been designated as you know, they need to be by themselves and try to get them redesignated <coughs> so that people could be put in their rooms. Oh, okay. And that's so you so you can use that extra bed, not that's to correct. make more single but it's rooms a, yeah, and that it's are real, truly single yeah. rooms than instead of using a double as a single. But it's not like there's tens of thousands of these rooms. I mean, it's not like there's 30 or 40 or 50 of these rooms. N the normal uh, rate of occupancy in the, the home is somewhere between 230 and 240. Oh, so it's almost. It's almost, almost there. Capacity. You know, and some of that's going to just be transition. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, there's not a lot that they can be gained. Clearly there can, there can be some. And yet 
that is, they have to look at every nook and cranny for mm -hmm. those types of savings. Can they do something with staffing and uh, like through attrition? So if a nurse or someone retires, that they don't have to replace them and maybe that could save some money? Again, that's a, they could do that, but it, you have... Have they talked about that? They haven't talked oh. about that because these are all union positions. I understand. You'd have to get agreement from the union to, to attrit that position. Oh, uh, really? Sure. You just can't not fill it. No, because the union will come back and say, look, what you're doing is you are understaffing the nursing home and that's putting our staff at risk as well as the patients. Do you think there's enough staff for the nursing home or do you think there's too much staff for According the nursing home? According to, I'm not an expert in nursing homes, so no. I go by what, what the experts have said right. and they, you compare it to the peers, mm -hmm. you know, like Van Rensselaer uh, Manor and a few of those others, that we are, we have about, uh, you know, I don't know, a third to a half, maybe more people than we really should. Oh, okay. I mean, it's, it's a significant number, and of course that number will fluctuate, uh, but it's a significant so, number. So you think that there could be downsizing on staffing without causing harm to the patients, clients in the nursing home? It would put us in a similar position with all the other nursing homes. Okay, which is when they're not in danger, all the other nursing homes you don't feel are endangering their patients. I right? wouldn't think so. The health okay. department watches this, they come in and inspect. Good. You know, they, they Have you been to things. the nursing home? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And what are your impressions personally about the nursing it's home? It's a nursing home. <laughs> does it smell, you know, what, does it I, smell I mean, like a nursing home? No. Does it, Feel like a, I mean, is it, it feels like a nursing home because nursing home feels you know feels like a nursing home. I mean, does it feel decrepit? Does it feel like it's as old as its patients? I mean, <laughs> it does suffer from some deferred maintenance. That's for sure. Okay. You know, they have issues. You know, the, the roof leaks, and we 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 authorized more than a million dollars to have the roof repaired. Uh, there are some issues. It used to be a much bigger facility, you know, uh -huh. and they've just kind of pared it down. But, and there was the anticipation that it was going to be replaced. Right. So they weren't going to pour, pour a whole bunch of money into but it. Now so they, there's that deferred maintenance issue. Mm -hmm. You know, let's go to another issue, and sure. it actually was a headlines in the Times Union that Bethlehem area, which again, like you are the legislator, or of the, at least some of Bethlehem, that the assessments are going through the roof. And I mean, this was a major issue. I mean, everything's an issue, but this was even headline story. So, um, you know, we have, again, Mark and I have many, many uh, legislators or councilmen and state assembly people, even senators. And in any case, Bethlehem people say, oh, we're doing very well with the budget. And I don't know why they have to, I mean, why all it's in excess, which means that there's going to be a lot more taxes coming in. I mean, if you're in the hole, you got to find money from somewhere. But if you have a, if you're doing well with the budget, why does they have to look for extra money and squeeze people? Well, it's not really a question of looking for extra money. It is the apportionment of that tax levy amongst the the homeowners in in the town. And to say it differently is that while the budget is going to be, and, and Mr. Clarkson has said, you know, the the budget increase they expect to keep within the, the tax caps, so it's going to be less than two percent. Uh, so it's not like they're going to get a whole lot more money. They're just going to spread it out a little more equitably amongst all of the properties in the town. Now, the, the state likes you to, to go through a reassessment to take in, into account market values and things like that about every four years. Uh, I think that we've gone six or seven years between uh, assessments. But what has also happened, and they found out when they went through the process, is that the large open tracts of land have not really been reassessed for a number of years, much more than six or seven, and it, it, it may be twice that, that number. Is this, on, this is farmland? Some or is somebody's five acres backyard, you know, like yeah. a big ranch house? And, area and it's, is, it's yeah. both of those. You know, farmland is part of it, but we don't have that many active farms in, in Bethlehem. What we do have is just like you say, you know, somebody who has five acres and they've got, you know, four acres is, is all forest. Uh, and that par portion, of it, portion of it is now has had increased value put to it. And so what happens is that the total value of the taxes needed, and whatever that number might be, and let's just use an example. Let's say it's, it's $30 million, and I don't know what it is for Bethlehem off the top of my head. Well, let's say it's $30 million. 
the amount of total property and how it's spread out, that's the divisor that gets divided into that number. That number has now changed. So what Mr. Clarkson has said, and, uh, and I believe it to be true, is that many people, and let's just assume that your piece of property did not change uh, assessment. I'm sure it didn't. Rather. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> didn't have, uh, didn't change. Your taxes will probably go down. How did you do with your property in Selkirk? It uh, stayed exactly the same, it but did. I'm in a different, you know, I'm in a different school district, and it's, it's a little more rural. I understand, but I like to no. put the personal touch no, on it. No, it, it, it stayed the same. <laughs> so, w these other folks, I mean, I, y there's some big names out there that are uh, prominent names mm -hmm. in the uh, area. People had their roads named after their family. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, have you, have they been in touch with you, but is there anything you can really do on the county level? Because the county doesn't give money to offset anything like right. this so it's not a county issue it, it really is a town issue and, and I have uh, heard from from these people primarily in the meetings that have been held by the town uh, and a lot of them are saying you know what they're going to do with their their five acres is they're going to have someone come in cut all those trees down sell off the wood and then they'll sell the property and you don't think that's a threat you don't oh, think I th they're just threatening to no no them, no? no I I think that they're I think that it's and a true statement. And you can do that according to zoning? To zoning well, it's their laws. property, yeah. Why, you can just build whatever you want? And what no, no, not zoning? build, but you could sell your property. Yeah. I mean, you sell want. off a few acres. Well, sure. Wants to buy if, it. if they can subdivide it, they may sell off the whole thing just because, yeah. in, in one case, this one gentleman was saying his property went from an assessment of $100,000 a year to $800,000 yeah. a year. Now, in a, in, you know, regardless of how much the, the yeah. incremental yeah. tax rate may go down, when you sustain an increase like that, it's going to have a tremendous impact on your pocketbook. And most of them are saying, we will not be able to afford it. Even though this property has been in my family for generations, and I know the Selkirks out on Maple Ave in, in, in Selkirk, you know, their, their great great ancestor fought in the Revolutionary War. <laughs> There's really? a plaque out that, you know, in one of the small little flower gardens, you know, that, that talks about. What the, how the community was named and who it was. Absolutely. There was a family called Selkirk. Huh? Yeah, they're still there. They're still there. They're still there. Okay. Uh, and, and they're going to see this tremendous increase. And just like happens with many of our mm. senior citizens uh, who have been in their homes for 30 or 40 years, you know, they're, they're almost lifetime residents in Bethlehem, and they've just seen the, the property taxes go up and up and up and up yeah, and huh. they can you know they no longer can afford but to live but they're getting more and more services that from when they first started so you know it's it's a growing community it is a growing and community. there are more services i know the bus line has certainly changed but the waters and the sewers and the infrastructure has really uh went by leaps and bounds in 30 years i mean uh, it's, it's so yes, much yeah, in some areas yeah in my area of selkirk we have while we have town water we will never see sewers. Okay. It's too expensive a proposition for them now. Okay, but that, but you know, you still got to pay. You're still part of the town. Oh, absolutely. So you still got to pay. You for still have to pay people. for it, yeah. even though you don't. You're not getting the benefit of it. You still well, have to pay for elderly, it. But that's okay. The elderly pay school taxes, and absolutely. they don't have anyone in the school system. So, it's that whole you know, community that's right, issue. issue, right? You know that that you know you're part of the community. You pay for all of the services that people enjoy. Because if you tried to parcel it out, uh, you know that people couldn't afford it. You know, a young family with two or three school-aged mm -hmm. children obviously mm -hmm. could never afford the burden of paying for school taxes right. if, it, if they had to bear the full burden of That's it. That's right. So how much of the town of Bethlehem's taxes uh, are tax-exempt? How much property is tax-exempt? Oh, I have no idea. Okay. Yeah. Again, when, I'm when on no, the county side. No, but you're a numbers yeah. guy. So I am a why, numbers guy. That's yep. why, and, and I thought maybe you know your wife is the receiver of taxes, yes, Nancy. That's, that's so correct. I just wanted to know maybe she's maybe there was conversation. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's not a number that we usually talk about. <laughs> okay. Because in Albany it's eighty percent. It is eighty yeah. percent. Yes. You know, in the city of Albany it's tax exempt because of all the uh, religious exemptions, the state land, you know, right. all the government the colleges, government yeah. buildings. Absolutely. Right. So, I just. No, threw it out. Just yeah. as, you know, we don't have. Obviously, we're nowhere near the kind of numbers that the city uh. of Albany is. But I'm sure there are some. Mm -hmm. But it, it's just my concern uh, about this whole assessment issue is that if the large landowners cannot afford the taxes, and they have to sell, that is going to throw an awful lot of open land, 
onto the market. Right. And the most logical people to, to pick up on that are going to be the, de the developers. And what you will see is a building boom in the town of Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. And so that the, that the, in the nature, the, the character of Bethlehem is going to change what is somewhat, you know, very rural to a large extent. You know, it's a, a nice mix between city and, and rural. Mm -hmm. will become much more citified because there are just going to be much more people. And of course, with much more people, you know, there's a, uh, an impact on all of the service levels. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, you know, the, it brings along with it its own set of problems. But I think that this one event is going to, uh, to change the composition. And, and the other thing that worries me a little bit, because I've heard, you know, I've read in the spotlight, you know, conversations that homeowners have had with the company that did the assessment. Oh. Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm just not comfortable with the kind of responses that they're getting. They, they seem to be somewhat non-professional. Uh, you know, it is what it is, and you know, yeah, we looked at yours, but we didn't look at the other three, and you know, they we're not going to. They didn't have enough time. They didn't have enough time. Right. You know, those are not adequate responses in my mind to mm -hmm. people who are now looking at making a major life change mm -hmm. because of this one event. And there's an appeal process also. There's an appeal process. So there's a fairly lengthy appeal process. So all of these, so uh, do the tax, do the higher taxes go into effect and then during the appeal process or is it stayed and, and you don't have to pay the higher tax until the appeal is? The, the appeal process is, being, is going on now. Right. And I think that the, the cutoff date for all the decisions is like July 1st. That's when they finalize the assessed values. Uh -huh. And then those assessed values be, will be used on the school tax bills that will come out okay. in September or October, whenever mm -hmm. that is. I think it's September. So all the appeals will be done by July 1. You hope so, yeah. Hope I so. mean, uh, there, there you have other avenues. Once that process mm -hmm. is, you can go to small claims court. There's some limited appeal process there. Uh, and adjustments can always be made after the fact. And you can appeal every year. Mm -hmm. uh, but... The majority of it is going to be done by July 1st. And do you think that through the appeal process, these large landowners might be appeased a little? I think they'll probably get some appeasement, but I don't think it's going to be anywhere near yeah, what they're, yeah. they're hoping for. And I, I worry about those people who are not as attuned to the process, either because they are not on the, the, the Internet you know, they may not read the spotlight, they get their bill and they say, oh, you know, it's, it's gone up and that's what it is, so I, I'll go ahead and pay yeah, it. Yeah, but it's public record. Absolutely. It's oh, so, yeah. so the folks who are organizing this anti, you know, this, this, uh, th these protests could find out who these large landowners are. And if they're not on the Internet, they can go knocking on their door and saying, hey, come on out, we're, you know, we're organizing, and they can get them. I mean, it takes footwork. So oh, it takes a know, lot of grassroots, footwork. Grassroots, as yeah. you know from an elected official. Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah. I, I also want you know, th you had in South Bethlehem, there was this plant that um, th their agreement with the town had ex expired, and the taxes actually went way down. On this plant, cogen plant or something, or oh well, what happened? And, was and I'm just wondering if the town is ba is preparing itself for another issue like that, you know, because taxes had to go up quite a bit, yeah, you know, because of that issue. It was a pilot program that was, I think, a 20-year pilot right. program that eventually ran its course, and all of a sudden, uh, where they were paying taxes up here because yeah. of that pilot program, when it ran out, their tax came down here. And I think it was like a $1.3 million hit, hit that's right. that the town took that you that all of us had to, to shoulder the shoulder burden. The burden. Right. Absolutely. So wouldn't that, wouldn't this compensate for having, for, for anything like that happening again? Aren't they learning from that lesson? And if something else would come along that maybe they have a big, bigger rainy day fund where you don't have to hike property taxes so high? Um, I don't know what their, their, their okay. plans are on that. I would hope that as we do pilot programs in order to bring, to entice businesses mm -hmm. to come in, that we remember that lesson yeah. so that we don't get hit as we did. Because, you know, you're just, you're writing a check that you're not cashing for 20 years, but when you have to cash it, it really hurts. Yeah, and no one saved any of it so no. for, that, for the rainy day fund. No. Well, <laughs> the it poured. The, the, rainy, the rainy day fund got all used up. You know, yeah. you know, well, that's it, what I mean. It poured. Right? Yeah. You know, they didn't budget it properly, even with, whether it's Republican administrations or Democratic administrations. 
it just wasn't done right. So. Well, you know, they're always walking the line. They're trying to, to minimize the tax impact, you know, and, and to mm -hmm. maximize the what you have in the funds. But they're at counter purposes. Yeah. And, you know, when you're up for election, yeah. you know, you shift the money into the... So. Okay. You know, we're out of time. We had a good, <laughs> you say it, a little Yiddish schmooze. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We were talking very nicely, but I want to say thank you to Rich Medix, and you're doing well for the county. And, thank you. And very continue welcome. with good, uh, your good work with good health. Well, thank, thank you very much. I appreciate it.